With the release of the Space Age DLC, Factorio has graduated from a game where you make a big factory and kill bugs, into a game where you make a big factory and kill bugs, but you also go into space. This gives me the perfect opportunity to thoroughly overthink the astrophysical implications of the game. First by looking at the planets themselves, and then looking at the spaceflight mechanics. So first up, are the planets realistic? Sure, why not? For a baseline reference, we have the starting planet, Nauvis, which we will take as just being a completely Earth-like planet. That said, it does differ from the Earth in two noticeable ways. Uh, one, the Earth is mostly water, with some land, in terms of its surface composition, but Nauvis is mostly land, with some water. And uh, number two, there don't appear to be any polar ice caps. Although the Earth didn't have large ice caps for all of its history, for instance having no or minimal ice during the Mesozoic period, which was the time of the dinosaurs, but having a substantial southern ice shelf during the Carboniferous, which was when the Earth was covered in giant bugs. Did those giant bugs rapidly evolve when exposed to pollution and also spit acid? The fossil record is unclear. Oh yeah, difference number three, Nauvis is covered in swarms of aggressive mutant bugs. There is only one planet inwards of Nauvis, which is Vulcanus. Its molten surface could be due to some combination of extreme irradiation from being so close to the sun, as well as the tidal forces exerted by the sun's gravity. Vulcanus is a truly massive planet with four times the surface gravity of Nauvis. If it has the same density as Nauvis, then this would put it as being a Neptune-sized rocky planet, which is just crazy big. The closest real-life comparison I can find to this is the rocky exoplanet TOI-849b, which is believed to be the core of a gas giant that was stripped of its gaseous envelope, leaving behind only the rocky interior. Maybe this was also the case for Vulcanus, starting life as some sort of hot Jupiter which lost its atmosphere to stellar irradiation. The third planet from the sun, Gleba, is an evil place. I hate these pentapods. The second I leave, a horde of them stomps my farms. I mean, it's a lush alien world with a thick CO2 atmosphere and twice the gravity of Nauvis. Unlike Nauvis, Gleba appears to have no large seas and instead has most of its water contained in marshes and swamps. Much like Vulcanus, Gleba is just like really, really big. It's kind of funny too because the gravity metric on planets that I'm relying on to infer their sizes uh, doesn't really seem to do much for the gameplay. It seems to just be that if you're in space between two planets, whichever one has the higher gravitational pull compared to how distant you are from it will determine which one you slowly get pulled towards. So as far as I know, these numbers weren't really intended to, to be thought of that much. So the fourth planet, Fulgora, is a smaller planet covered in large oil sands with islands of desert terrain that you can build on. It has less atmospheric pressure and gravity when compared to Nauvis, and it has massive lightning storms. It's also covered in the ruins of an ancient alien civilization. With that, we're really hitting on a trend here. Every planet so far has had life on it, or at the very least, evidence of previous life. This is despite Vulcanus being seemingly too hot for liquid water, and Fulgora being too cold, with your only source of water being ice. For Fulgora, we could probably just say like, okay, it used to have liquid water, but some environmental catastrophe made it suddenly much too cold, hence why the ancient aliens are all dead. For Vulcanus, well, I got nothing. Maybe the demolisher worms don't need water? Maybe they aren't carbon-based life? The presence of coal on the planet, which is formed from dead plants being compressed on geological timescales, uh, seems to suggest otherwise. Anyway, last but not least, we have Aquilo. This is a planet covered in a massive liquid ammonia ocean, meaning the surface temperature of the planet has to be around negative 70 degrees Celsius, or around negative 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Any building the player does here is done on icebergs, and all buildings must be heated at all times in order to prevent them from freezing solid. Surely if any planet in the solar system were to not have life, it would be this one. And while there are no signs of anything currently alive, the crude oil deposits in the oceans again suggest that there was life on this planet sometime in the past, if not currently. Apparently there are hypothetical ways in which crude oil or petroleum could form without the requirement of life to exist, but seeing as 4 out of 5 of the planets provably have or had life, 
what's the harm in adding one more to the list? Not only that, but the presence of either coal or oil on every planet seems to indicate that all life in this solar system is carbon-based, which is kind of neat. Okay, so the planets themselves are all plausible enough, although the existence of life on every single planet makes our real-life solar system seem incredibly dead by comparison. Now the space flight is where I can really start nitpicking. Like for one, there's just so many asteroids. This is a common sci-fi trope, making asteroid fields just entirely full of rocks, when in reality the asteroid belt has asteroids spread a million kilometers apart from each other on average. Of course, this would make for pretty boring gameplay, if you could barely mine anything. Also, not only are the asteroid belts incredibly thick and just filled to the brim with rocks, but there's seemingly an asteroid belt in between every single planet. Next up, the orbital distances make no sense. Uh, planets are listed as being 15,000 to 30,000 kilometers apart from each other, which means they are closer together than the moon is to the Earth. It's a shame that the game is limited to this 2D top-down perspective, because the night sky on Nauvis must look crazy. Speaking of the distances between planets, when you start flying to another planet, you have to apply thrust the entire time until you reach your destination. And that's not really how spaceflight works. In real life, when sending probes to other planets, they accelerate until they reach whatever target trajectory they have, and then they coast to their destination, maybe doing some correction burns on the way, and then firing up their engines again to decelerate and or perform aerobraking capture maneuvers. Of course, in real life, this is done as a cost-saving measure, and with the excess of any good factorio factory, I can concede that this likely wouldn't be an issue for our engineer. Even then, they'd still have to flip around and decelerate once they pass the halfway point, which doesn't happen in-game. Another funny thing is that if you stop thrusting, you just slow down <laughs> instead of continuing to coast. Is this, is this drag? Is there air resistance in space? With how many asteroids there are, maybe, maybe there actually is just drag. There are just so many micrometeoroids and dust particles that I guess it would just slow you down. Now, is that a realistic thing that could actually happen? Oh yeah, the planets also don't move. Okay, that's it, that's the video. Obviously, these quote-unquote criticisms are all in good fun. I do not think the game would be in any way improved if there were a million times fewer asteroids to mine, or if they added an orbital transfer window planning tool where if you don't pack enough fuel, you just get lost forever in interplanetary space. At the end of the day, the gameplay is excellent, the settings are unique and varied, and that's what really matters. Okay, bye.